I don't know if you are familiar with one of the variants of the legend of King Arthur. According to some variants, he was the son of the great king, Uta Pendragon. But from, a, uh, from his birth, he was hidden in obscurity. And then, at the age of 15, he was at a tournament for the great knights of the realm. And in a, sword, a sword was found in a churchyard in a, embedded in a big stone. And round it, in golden letters, was, Whoever draws this sword shall be rightful king of England, because Uther Pendragon had died and left the kingdom without a king. And all the knights at the tournament, the whole knights of the whole country were there, and none of them could draw out this sword. And then, almost by accident, Arthur is looking for a sword, because he is a squire, a servant, and he pulls the sword out easily, and then he is made king of England. And of course, he is not immediately recognised. There are those who recognise him and those who do not. But after many battles, he is made king of England. And he rules, perhaps successfully or unsuccessfully, for many years, the kingdom of Logris, the kingdom of Albion, or England. And at the end, he fights the Battle of Camlan, his enemy Mordred. And he kills and is mortally wounded and is taken to the Isle of Avalon, where he waits to return and save England in its greatest hour of need. Of course, you might be thinking that actually his return is long overdue. What kind of king would Arthur be when he came back? Of course, I doubt whether anyone here actually does believe that Arthur is going to return, but the bigger question is, what kind of Jesus, what kind of Messiah are we expecting to return? The Jews of the day of Jesus had their own views of what this Messiah should be like, and we're going to hear about that in a minute. But back to our text, Rod, Mike and I have been going through the book of Mark, and we're in the last third of the book, and it happens, all happens in the final week before the Lord's crucifixion. And events are sort of piling one upon another at breakneck speed. I'd never realised that these events all happen so quickly and so close together. And Jesus is actually only a few days, a couple of days away from an event where he has prayed himself a death so awful that he prayed that if it was possible, it would be removed from him. He even tells a parable which Mike covered a couple of weeks ago, which was describing the whole scenario, how that the wicked husbandman who was supposed to be looking after the vineyard in parable form, it was the leaders of the Jews were looking after the nation, had misused their power and authority and had plotted to murder the son of the Landover when he, was, he had come, Jesus himself. So if you look at the diary, how it played out, on Sunday, Jesus enters Jerusalem to a triumphant entry, what we know today as Palm Sunday. On the Monday, he cleanses the temple. On the Tuesday to the Thursday, he is in the temple and he is engaged with a series of confrontations with the various establishment leaders, any of importance, chief priests, teachers of the law, elders, Pharisees, Herodians, Sadducees, and each group takes a run at Jesus, challenging his authority with a view to discredit him, to undermine him, to catch him out. And as Rod mentioned last week, they threw questions at Jesus designed to entrap him, designed to be impossible to give a considered and informed answer, carefully cra crafted to trap Jesus into saying something that could be used against him and could be used to discredit him. The remarkable thing about it is that at each question, Jesus sort of bats it aside effortlessly. They are left speechless. The tables are turned. But Jesus is not answering these questions like this just to score points, just to humiliate them. It's actually, if they were able to, listen and learn. He has things to tell them, to inform them and teach them of the truth, if they would just listen. And another point is that whilst these questions that we, we heard, Dave just mentioned one of them about the question about the resurrection, they sound trivial, they sound contrived, they sound a bit manufactured, but they all were covering serious issues alive then and they are alive today. 
So, the first one. The delegates from the chief priests, the elders and the scribes, question him about his authority. The question of religious authority. Where does it come from? The Pharisees are Herodians, not natural allies, but they are united in opposition to Jesus. They answer him a, ask him a trick question about tribute and the role, effectively, of civil authorities. And Ron mentioned this, that actually all these questions tie in and overlap with some of the question, things and issues that Mike has been covering in, his, in the book of Romans. So in this particular one, it is what is the Christian or what is our relationship to civil authorities. With the Sadducees, we have this rather contrived story about remarriage and the afterlife. And then, finally, the scribes come with what is the greatest commandment of the law? What is the role of morality, of ethics? What actually is the relationship between, for us nowadays, the old and new covenant? And as I said, and Rod said, all of these questions were designed to trap. And despite all that, he taught them truth. And his answers evoked silence and wonder. And he reached the point now where no one dared answer him a question. And so he now turns the tables on them. He challenges them with a much greater question. Now, our reading this morning is splits into three. So what kind of Messiah are we expecting? <coughs> Beware of the scribes. And she gave more than all of them. So to start with, we cover the first bit which Robert read. Then Jesus answered and said, While he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? So in the previous discussions Jesus had had with the Jewish authorities, Jesus was defending himself against hostile questions, but he now challenges them, the scribes, the guardians and expounders of the Hebrew scriptures, who consider themselves the authorities of truth. And so he asks them a question about the nature of the Messiah. He says to them, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? So he's effectively asking, what do the scribes mean when they say that Messiah is the son of David. It is asked in the context that there's a general expectation at that day of the kingdom of Israel being restored. And Israel will be made great again. We knew from the entry into Jerusalem that popular hopes were being expressed at that celebration. The crowd says, Blessed be the kingdom of our father David, which is coming. For the scribes and Pharisees, there was this idea of national deliverance, which would be achieved under Davidic leadership. And they believed this. They believed that the scriptures taught this. And Jesus was not saying, you're wrong. He's not challenging them to deny this. But he's saying there's something more to it than this. The question was, how do we understand this? Because, he then quotes a scripture they all knew well, a scripture which they should have known well. He quotes from Psalm 110. He says, For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore David calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. So to start off with, just to break the ice, Jesus says, this is a psalm, but it's not just written by anybody. This person you, when we're talking about, David, he actually wrote this. He was the one to whom the promises had come that of his descendants, Messiah would come. And here it is, David himself has said this psalm himself. And this is not David's personal opinion, not his hope. This is not something which he would like to happen. This is something it says was inspired by the Spirit of God. David is speaking as a prophet. So this not is wishful thinking. This is something which is certain and incontrovertible. So this text Jesus raises is critical to our understanding of the text, of the question that has been raised. In what sense is the Messiah the son of David? Because in that text, God himself, Yahweh, speaks to the Messiah and says, sit at my right hand. So the Messiah is pictured as sitting, placed at the 
The right hand always speaks to the highest position of power. There is. Jesus is not standing. He is there waiting. But he is not there passive. It's not just, well, you sit there and uh, I'll sort it out for you. Being at the right hand of power, being at the right hand of God, meant that Jesus himself was exercising that power. And when it says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies the footstool, it isn't, well, you sit there and when it's gone, be off on your way. What Jesus is saying and what the psalm is saying is that you will be there until it's finished. I will do everything and you will do everything that is needed to be done. You'll be sitting there and after. And so David, despite his own earthly and political greatness, is recognising that the one receiving the promise, the Messiah, is not only far greater than himself, with far higher authority, but he's God himself. Now the scribes had viewed Messiah as some kind of King Arthur figure. He is the son of David who is going to simply restore the kingdom of David and restore greatness to Israel. But Jesus is saying, Jesus is far more than that. He is much more. He is the Lord. And he will not only restore the kingdom of David, but establish an entirely new kingdom, a different kind of kingdom, where he is exalted as king at God's right hand, an everlasting dominion, a kingdom that knows no end. So then, this is the greatest question of all. Who is Jesus? Is he just simply a descendant of David? Yes, but he is much, much more. And it says here that the common people heard him gladly. They sensed the discomfort of the scribes and perhaps enjoyed watching it. And they responded enthusiastically to Jesus' teaching. But they didn't really understand what it was all about. But things were going to get a bit more awkward for the scribes as we see in the next section. Then he said to them in his teaching... Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. So as we've already said that the scribes were the teachers and guardians of Scripture. They devoted their whole lives to following and understanding it. And in that society of that day, they were revered and venerated with unbounded respect. When a scribe walked down the streets, everyone would stand up, apart from tradesmen who were exempted if they were busy at their work. They were greeted with titles of deepest respect, like rabbi, master, father. And it's believed actually the term rabbi during that time had gone from a general mark of respect, but result reserved exclusively for the scribes. So it wasn't just simply a honour anymore, it was just for them. And these people had unbounded influence on the religious lives of the nation. And these are the people Jesus is saying, beware of them, look out for them, and be on your guard. He says, beware of the scribes, they love long robes. They wore long white linen robes as a mark of distinction. Everyone could see when they walked down the road that there was a scribe coming. They loved to be noticed, and they reveled in their position. And as such, they demonstrated that they were above the mark of ordinary people. Beware of the scribes. They loved greetings. They desired and demanded recognition from others. They had this image of the holy men of God. Beware of the scribes. They loved the best seats in the synagogues and feasts. They demanded the perks, status and privilege. Beware of the scribes. Despite their image of godliness and holiness, they were merciless and rapacious. Whilst they were not allowed to be pay for their teaching they, they weren't supposed to receive any money for it they could receive gifts and they were more than happy to get them and as such they preyed on the vulnerable and the needy they used flattery and manipulation to extract benefits from those who were often widows and due to their position they felt they deserved not just honor and recognition but they deserved the greatest acts of giving to them or so they taught and finally, beware of the scribes, for pretense they make long prayers. Their prayers were not true acts of worship. They were a charade. They were a show. They were to show others their supposed piety. They were just pretend. And Jesus doesn't sugarcoat his condemnation. He says, they will receive the greater condemnation. 
Their supposed religiosity, their piety, their shows of holiness may fool people, but they did not fool God by their actions. It's a terrible thing to play at religion. You may convincingly deceive other people, but you will never deceive God. The final section is about the widow. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many were ri- who were rich put in much. Then one widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. I'm sorry, I'm speaking from the 2011 version of the NIV. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. They all put in out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. The setting for this incident happens is what part of the temple known as the Court of the Women. Jesus was sitting on a bench opposite and watching the place where people bought, brought contributions to the temple treasury. Now, according to Jewish writings, there were 13 trumpet-shaped receptacles. So people just would put these things in these trumpets and you hear it rattle down to the bottom. And so, actually, it was a very public way of giving. But each of these receptacles had an inscription on it, and that was to indicate where that money was reserved for. And Jesus is just watching them. He sees the wealthy give their offerings, and you can imagine that it was a very showy affair. The more you gave, the more noise you made. And then this poor widow, someone unnoticed and insignificant, and is seen by Jesus to throw what is called two lepton, that's the word, the smallest coin that there was. And John, um, Mark, for the benefit of Roman readers, for the, because these, these coins were not used in the Western Empire, mentions it as a quadrant. It was one sixty-fourth of a day's wage. So you can imagine that it's probably only a couple of pounds. And that probably was all she had to live on that day. Now, you could imagine her coming along. No one saw her. No one noticed her. She was almost hiding in plain sight. She was a widow for a start, so no one thought much of her. She probably was shabbily dressed. But it's almost embarrassing. You saw these people giving you all this money, and someone throws these two little coins in there, and you think, is she taking the rip or something? What's she playing at? But the Lord's answer is just remarkable. She gave it willingly. She could have given one of them and kept the other for herself. She could have taken the view that this temple has so much money that it doesn't really need mine. But he calls his disciples to give them a lesson that they needed to learn. This woman, the one you probably didn't even notice, the one you probably despised, has given more money than not just any one of those people. She has given more money than the whole lot of them put together. How is that so? Because what they gave, they had plenty left. She gave because she was poor, and she gave all her living. Now, Jesus does not give praise that is undeserved. And there's very little praise in the New Testament which matches what the Lord praised this lady. So in conclusion, we got three points. The greatest question of all, who is Jesus? There's an old hymn by John Newton that starts like this. What think you of Christ is the test to try both your state and your scheme. You cannot be right in the rest unless you think rightly of him. As Jesus appears in your view, as he is beloved or not, so God is disposed toward you, a mercy or wrath or your lot. There are lots of questions we can ask about Christianity regarding our faith and Many of them are very well worth asking. Mike mentioned last week about the question of things disputable. As individuals, we can hold private opinions. And it's not, as Mike said, these are things worthless. We should all have opinions on things, but there are some things that are just not worth arguing about. They're not worth discord or disagreement, but there are other things which are perhaps less controversial and we can have discussions surrounding them. And we saw some of these questions, which are still hot topics today. What is the source of nature of authority in faith and practice? What is the afterlife like? 
What is our relationship with civil authorities? What is the relationship with faith and practice in terms of new covenant and old covenant? And these are all really important questions. But the one question which is more than all of them is, who is Jesus? What is our relationship with him? Because we can be right on every single one of those questions. If we get this one wrong, we are nowhere. Who is Jesus and is he your Lord? This is where everything must start and everything will follow through <coughs> rightly from this if you get this right. It's not just our identities, but our relationships with others in the church. This is a bit of a side topic, but the church is made of individuals, as varied as can be. And this is as it should be. We're not all intended in this church to be the same, and actually we aren't, fortunately. The only thing that holds us together is our allegiance to Jesus as a result of his indescribable love towards us. And if we lose sight of this, if other considerations and factors become the basis for our fellowship with others, we have little cliques forming the church, and Jesus is no longer the first, and we are actually in danger of idolatry. Because that is what an idol is. It is anything that becomes more important to us than God himself. But to return to our main question, who is Jesus? Is he a friend? Someone kind? Someone who's loving towards children? Someone who helps us out when we need? Someone who we want to be beside us? Yes, but he is much more than that. He is the Lord. He is the King. He is God. And to him belongs all power and authority. And at his name, one day, every knee shall bow. The second point is beware of the scribes. And as I'm sure most of you are aware, we don't see many people in Pontsbury walking around with long right, white robes. But it is the nature of people to seek power, respect and position. And religion is a vehicle, not the only one, but it's often used to achieve this. We're aware, I'm sure, of the, wealth and of the wealth and prosperity gospel, where the leaders have immense wealth and they drive around in private planes. But we can have the curse of the scribes in our own churches without having these extremes. They can have the same characteristics of pride and the abuse of power. And these two things have afflicted the church over the century and churches. And just because we've reached the 21st century doesn't mean they've gone away. Pride is a self-deception that we have earned position and power for ourselves and deserve recognition for it. And it can affect us all, but chiefly affects those in position and leadership. And crises happen in church often are not because of outside influences, because of a heresy. They are self-generated. They are caused by pride and self-interest from within, where strong personalities wage war over the right way to do things. And they may not even recognise it as pride. It could be that I'm fighting for the truth. I want the right thing to happen here. And they ignore the opinions and views of anybody else. And closely related to this is the abuse of power. It's the exploitation of others which results from pride and arrogance. In cults we know that leaders are notorious for holding such power over followers that they force them and coerce them to do anything. But abuse of power is not just limited to cults. Pastors and ministers can wield excessive power without accountability. And it can happen when leaders view themselves as indispensable to God's kingdom. They are placed there by God. They are God's men. And so have little accountability to others. And they've lost sight of their accountability to God himself. And so as such, the leadership of churches and this church needs prayers. Now, Job, I'm sure, does your dad have a Ferrari? You seem a bit uncertain now. I might have to. Does he drive in a private plane? No. Well, that's good. But of course, for all of us, pride and these things of abuse of power can happen in all sorts of different ways. And so we have to beware because it is in each one of our hearts. The final section is be recognised by the one who really matters. Now, the passage about the widow doesn't actually say that she was the greatest, but actually from that commendation of Jesus, 
I would be more than happy to have that, more than anything in the world. And yet, she was unaware of it all. She did what she did, not she was expecting to earn anything, not that she's expecting anything back, not that she's expecting praise, notice or recognition. She did so willingly, out of love for God. So just as the disciples needed the lesson, that this unknown woman, this poor widow, who no one even noticed, has given a gift that delighted God, greater than the gifts of all those put together around her, perhaps that's a lesson we can learn. Now, of course, there are a number of things we have to say about this. We give according to what we have, rather than what we don't have. God is well aware of what resources we have or haven't got. God doesn't value our giving in what form by its amount, but by the heart that gives it. And of course we give freely, without compulsion, not grudgingly or because we feel guilty, because God loves a cheerful giver. Because actually God doesn't need our money. It's a privilege for us to give, and he will bless us and re- far more in return. And saying that point, the church or other organisations should never weaponize this particular thing to guilt trip or coerce members into unreasonable demands. Giving is free. It cannot and should never be compelled. Our gifts might actually take many forms. In this instance, it happened to be money. But it could be time. It could be help. It could be attention. They could be more costly to you than money itself. And others may not even realise what you're doing. And they don't need to, because God sees. It could be carrying out duties we would rather not do. Things are quite ordinary and mundane. And your giving may actually be in many avenues. I mean, I know many churches view the only vehicle for giving is the church, and it's kind of a little tax kind of thing. But actually, our giving to God can take many forms. It could be to other Christian ministries. It could be to those who are in need. But the important thing is our heart, that we're giving to the Lord. And churches should value the gifts from everybody. It doesn't matter how small or great they are. The smallest gift may have been the most generous and costly to the individual. Because in an age where the Christian ministry has become increasingly professionalised and church organisations have become more corporate and business-like, the tendency is actually to only focus on really the bottom line and how much money we're getting in. And that's missing the point completely. Because at the end of the day, it's a God-centred view of giving that we are after. But also, this is not a call to be reckless and irresponsible. It's just a cause, call to generosity and devotion towards God. Because in this day and age, I know that I myself have forgotten what perhaps less sophisticated ages knew and believed, that God actually does supply our needs. We're so used to the pay packet coming, we're so used to all things so being ordered, that we have forget, actually, at the end of the day, it's God who gives us everything. All that we have is given to us from God, and God wants us. Not what we have, he wants us. And as such, our lives are open for him, without no-go areas, without hidden rooms. I'll finish with a quote from one of the verses which Mike would have covered last week. For none of us lives for himself alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. And maybe that's the thing we can go away with this week, that if we are the Lord's, we remember that. If we are not the Lord's, maybe it's high time we sought to find to know him. Shall we sing the final hymn, 303?